The one thing that even the President of the Republic of South Africa highlighted is the fact that when he delivers his State of the Nation addresses, he was local. And as I said earlier on, I also did my best to wear local. And I can be, send a big shout out to Relevance for Men who sorted me out with the shoes. And of course, buying and wearing local is the one thing that we all should be believing in. The other important point that I keep telling you is that guess what? Tomorrow, for those of us that struggle to navigate our way through the different regulatory issues in order to be able to get our access to the market, we will bring you no less than 15 different regulatory agencies in the Business Solutions Hub where you can actually interact with them and ask them the simple question of, guys, the one time I logged into this website and I thought that this document was going to go and make its way into some evaluation, it never happened. How do you help me? How do you assist me? So that's definitely going to be the key highlight of tomorrow's summit as we get into the third day. But of course, as I said earlier on today, even though I'd like to believe that I wore the best that I could find in my wardrobe, I'm about to be completely over, I don't know, overwhelmed. I think I'm going to be overtaken because the people that you're going to see on stage right now not only have an intimate understanding of fashion, they actually live it. And of course, this is, of course, the panel that's going to focus on whether we are wearing local. And wearing local is indeed lacquer. Now, of course, the one person who probably understands all of these things much better than I could, if you go to her Instagram, you get to see the different ways in which she dresses up and the different labels that she still turns to promote as African labels. And this is someone who obviously has a very, very intimate belief in saying that we must not only speak the language, but we must also act on it and do the things that we're all promoting that need to be done. She's also very well esteemed. And for those of us who cannot sing, she's a person that we'll probably never get to share a stage with. So I think that this is the one moment where earlier on, as I said to you, I'll never host Miss South Africa. So I pretended that we had a Miss South Africa moment earlier on with the DTI scene. And now, because I will never ever be on Idols or in any singing competition, the only opportunity I get to share a stage with Unati Ngai is this one. Unati, welcome. Thank you, Kai. I'm not deserving of that beautiful intro. And you deserve a no, hug. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> All the best. Eh? Are you well? You look phenomenal. Yes, yes, yes. It's relevance for men out here. You must be, you must be kinder to happen. yourself. They you look phenomenal. For thank you, thank you. Thank How you. do you feel? I'm very excited because this is the one panel that we've been waiting for because obviously, you know, those of us that want to start planning our wardrobe, this is the panel that gets to tell us how to do these things, how to get these things right. And more importantly, with that keen eye of saying, you can do this locally. Yeah. You don't have to go all the way to Milan for Fashion Week in order to know how to dress appropriately. Look at you. It's all local. And I'm about to learn how to do it. Thank you so much. Thank you and all the best. Kaya, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. <laughs> As Kai has mentioned, my name is Ornati, and I'm completely honored to be hosting this panel. Not only because I believe in South African designers, our prints, our resources, but because I know we're a beautiful people. Growing up off the continent of Africa, I was very starved by everything that our creatives do today, and it's a supreme honor. What a humble question, though. Zanzi, are you wearing local? It's polite because what it stands for is, are you aware of what you represent when you introduce yourself to the rest of the world? Are you aware of what you are saying to the world without even opening your mouth? So when Makasa is at New York Fashion Week and Nungu Diamonds is dominating the global sphere when it used to be not quite the Bule family, and when Asanda says, I'm going to design new prints, and when Imprint says, I'm going to recreate our heritage. And when Hangwani of Rubicon says, I'm going to redefine grace when it comes to our fabric. We know that those geniuses understand the assignment. And that's why I'm honored to be here today. Because not only am I a walking canvas, but I also get to be an orator for these incredible creatives today. 
Good afternoon to all our execs. Good afternoon to all our guests today. And we thank you for your time. I'd like to start in Cape Town. One of our esteemed judges, our esteemed panel members, is the one and only Mr. Gavin Raja. Internationally acclaimed with his Atelier range, he dressed me today. He doesn't know this. <laughs> When I looked at the panel, I thought, how do I best represent the panel as best as I can? And this is his design from his atelier. His obsession for women, his obsession for the female form is absolutely humbling. Can we get a few images of Mr. Gavin Raja and can we cross over to him and greet him, please, all the way in Cape Town? Can we give him a round of applause in the room? <laughs> Hello, my darling. Mm -hmm. Hi, Anati. How are you, sweetheart? I'm great, my love. How are you? I'm really good, thank you. Thanks for having me. Oh, thank you for your time. You know that the one thing God does not make more of is time. And between your designs, but also all the philanthropic things that you do around the world, and also your contribution to Harvard University, we know that time is very precious. So thank you, Gavin, for your time. I just want to introduce the rest of the panel. Our next guest landed literally... I think three hours ago from Dubai, <laughs> founder and owner of Nungu Diamonds, Mr. Kialebucha Pule. An ode to Nungu Diamonds as well. I speak of creative. Thank you so much. Anytime. You so much. I speak of creatives in the, in the fashion sense because sometimes when we have run out of the words and our melodies have run out, we rely on your creativity. Kialebucha. Mr. Pula and his wife. We sat last year and I had a music video to shoot with a, f a gentleman called Afro Traction. The music video was celebrating, is celebrating African love. Mr. And Mr. Mr. and Mrs. Pula sat me down and they said, what would you like us to create for your music video? And I said, I'm humbled, anything you want. And they said, what is the video about? And I said, African love. And I said, Nguni love. And what they did was create this bracelet for me, which is a replica of the Zulu love letter. They went extensively into research. The colors, what does the blue stand for? What does the green stand for? What does the red stand for? And they created this. And this is what I speak of our artisans is that their visions and their imagery and their genius speak long after we have failed to say the words or express ourselves. And this is the creativity we're celebrating today. I'd like to welcome on stage another panelist of ours, Sandy Rogers, representing Quip Studios. Sandy, please join us on stage. The beautiful diversity of South Africa is represented in everything that we do. The femininity of our lines and how we represent ourselves, and this is what Quip Studios represents for us as South Africans. Thank you so much, and thank you for being part of the panel today. Thank you. We're going to get into these wonderfully feminine and bold designs as soon as we have the rest of the panel on us with and us. It's Coop Studio. Coop Studio. It was a co-op. Thank you, Coop. but I love that because I th <laughs> because also part of it is is heritage, yes. and it's in representation, and it's how we how we how we honor each other earnestly and it's in pronunciations it's in representations and it's in how we how we express ourselves so thank you thank so you. coop not cool yes it was a co-op and then it became a coop i love that <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> from co-op to coop i'd like to welcome our next panelist with us and our next panelist representing lisella tanya makalach please can you come and join us on stage we're talking about a meaning, kasisotu, that means cloth. Uh, would you like some help? Are you fine? I'm good. Thank, Thank you. you. I sit next to you. Anytime, yeah. We're talking about a meaning, kasitswana, which means cloth. Kasisotu, which means cloth. Mm -hmm. Colloquially meaning styling of clothing. Part of our history is adopted prints. Part of our history is the evolution of prints. And the beautiful thing is that we're talking about the evolution of prints and the evolution of our fabrics within our cultural heritage. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. We continue with our panel and we ask to join us on stage, Silo Medupe, Scalo Designs, from Soweto to the world. Silo and I were talking off stage and he said to me, I need to bring on my Sasha Fields. 
Because that's what it's about, right? It's about pushing ourselves beyond the boundaries and pushing ourselves into places of uncomfortability that become so extraordinary that we can, literally, when we introduce you, we say, from Soweto to the world. Thank you for your time. Thank you for having me. I'd like to welcome our last panelist, last but not least, Hangwani, representing Rubicon. The elegance of women that Hangwani has managed to capture and to do for us through all our shapes and sizes. Hangwani has had the unfortunate, uh, I don't know if it's a challenge <laughs> or blessing, dressing women like me through all our different phases of being slender, being pregnant, being postpartum. Yeah. Um, and it's just, it's such a beautiful thing that you represent for women in South Africa and for all of us as a whole. Thank you to all of you for joining us. Thank you for having us. Gav, I'm going to cross over to you in Cape Town. There's a reason why your work stands out amongst the rest on a global scale. The attention to detail that I see in your workshop, from your seamstresses to the way you, you apply buttons and the way you, you just contour the female form. Why fashion and not fine art, and not sculpting and not textile design? Um. You know, for me, I think I approach design in a very kind of holistic manner. So uh, people who know me know that I designed the print. So the print that you're wearing at the moment is also custom uh, design print. And I think um, I approach things from a very artistic uh, kind of perspective. I mean, I work with lots of artists as well. So I don't feel as a designer, one needs to be constrained by what, by what just fashion offers. I think... Uh, we're living in a world at the moment which is, um, you know, just there's such a kind of melding of identity and culture that one can't be confi confined geographically. And I think if you think about it, one out of, they say four out of five people in 2050 will be African. So where does that leave us with an identity? And where does that leave me just as a creative? I think it leaves me uh, with far more greater kind of um, things to access, to create things, to make beautiful things. And we continue doing so in different ways and different fabrics and different resources. Gelebucho, we often speak about our resources on the continent, um, things that are taken from us on a global scale because it's fashionable and, yeah. and the world has just fallen in love with us. But gold and diamonds yeah. will always be ours. Absolutely as a black young family navigating in historically, uh, not young and black <laughs> industry. <laughs> How are you navigating through that and also managing to remain purely, purely South African in spite of the investments that possibly come, the interests that possibly come, um, and I guess the, the PR windfall that's, that's, that's following you and your beautiful wife. Thank you so much. I think. One of the things that I, I talk a lot with my wife about is <clears throat> we, we want to build the business we can buy from, first of all, right? So it becomes easy for us to say, in whatever we do, we want to represent who we are and, and the people that buy from us need to see it and it has to be authentic in how we do it. And then and how you're saying, diamonds have always been not only seen as a space where black people don't play, but they've never had a, a positive I guess, outlook around black people or the continent of Africa. Diamonds have always been looked at as this resource that fuels conflict. And us coming into it is a, is a way to change that narrative. To say as, as black South Africans, young as we are, we want to own that space and begin telling a different story. And we tell it with absolute pride. And one of the most important things that, that keep us in business is managing our relationships. I mean, we can talk about ours for an example, right? So, so we, we, we value the people we work with. We work with them in a way that shows them that they, they, they become the only thing that matters when we deal with them in the same way as we did. And it, 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 it has sustained us and it continues to do so as we move forward. Sandy, we speak of moving forward in the evolution of South African fashion. Bespoke is something, a word, that we haven't historically used for a very long time with pride. Because, you know, South African is South African is a humble country and, and we're taught to, to, to 
I don't want to say normalize mediocrity, but in, in not celebrating how phenomenal we are, we sometimes can. But you have a multiple of, of sewing, sewing stations. You, you believe in, in the utmost of luxury, and hence we can say bespoke. As an African woman employing other Africans, why has it taken us so long to be so unapologetically, insanely incredible, like you, like Nungui, like Gavin Raja? Um, I think it's always been there as um, how we've enjoyed expressing ourselves through clothing. And I just think now there's, um, the whole world is a lot more open to how you dress. And I think South Africans and especially African women are able to wear things with such abandon and beauty, it's, it's quite breathtaking. And I think that's what's captured the world. It's like when you see it being, you see clothing being worn, whether it's a real bespoke piece or something that's, you know, that someone's just put together with some, some finds they've got in their wardrobe and they're able to put that together and look incredible. I think it's just expressing yourself, but it's, fashion has become, and, and even after COVID now, when you see the collections that are coming through, I see all the fashion that comes through Coop Studio with the young designers I'm working with. I think people are playing again and they're wanting to actually toss off all that COVID dreariness and express colour, print and, and new shapes. It's really exciting. We humorously made reference to co-op earlier on. Yes. But it truly is a co-op when you speak of bespoke, because there's, can you take us through some of the intricacies that people don't realize and how the value chain of, of employment gets bigger and bigger, as bolder as you become? There's the beading, there's the fabrics, there's the seamstresses, uh, the making of patterns, and that's an entire economy of people that you are hiring circle, as JR would have put it years ago, gets bigger. I think when, I always thought sometimes it's fascinating to me that when someone actually purchases something, so from the concept to the customer, every piece of work that goes into that final purchase is actually a miracle that it ended up like that sometimes, <laughs> truly. I mean, you have to first come up with the idea, then you've got to make a pattern that works, it can take a few tries. Then you've got to find the right fabric that you've got enough of or that will stand a wash test. You have to check that that all works. You have to, if you're doing a print on it, you have to check that it's not going to wash off or the beading isn't. Then it's what kind of care are you going to tell the customer to give that garment? And then it goes into the whole process of grading the pattern, cutting, making sure there are no mistakes, making sure that when it gets sewn, it's sewn beautifully press, swing tickets, labels, that's a whole industry in itself. The, the logo design that the designer comes up with, that feeds a whole other industry. So it's each part of the um, value chain is, is quite remarkable. And I think that people have, we've grown and grown over the years and it's come back in a lot of ways and it's really exciting. When I started my career, clothing was, uh, the fashion industry and the manufacturing industry was huge. And then obviously everything went to China. But now it's coming back and I see more and more like, um, it's actually coming back and if we're ready for it, it's coming back in a big way. I'm happy you said that. And, and Tanya, all, all Tanya's been going, as you've been speaking, is going, mm, mm. <laughs> She's like, mm hmm, mm, mm, mm hmm. Because it is about the value chain and it is about keeping the resources here on the continent. I remember arriving in Joburg um, about 20 years ago, Tanya, and watching a documentary about how the Jewish community ha manages to keep the one rand circulating within the community 19 yes. times. Yes. And I found this to be a astounding, and I was like, we need to do this. Mm. And it's obviously something we are doing. And as you're saying, we're bringing things back from being manufactured off the continent. Having to make ready wear now for South African women, because we've, we've got our jewelry and we've got our atelier and we've got our bespoke, but it's the everyday as well that we mm. still want to feel absolutely special and powerful in. The ethos behind the woman that you're designing for compared to the woman that you're actually providing for back then when you were starting your, your design label, has it met all your dreams? 
Not yet. I think it will, I though. I love your honesty. It will, though. <laughs> I think um, our idea for Lucilla is to have, like, um, you know, our traditional wear worn every day. Because we're the only nation on the continent, well, one of the few, that, that don't wear the traditional yes. wear in boardrooms and exactly. in meetings yes. every single day. So, um, I've, uh, you know, I've had conversations with other women and, and men as well, because we make for men as well, and the response is always, but how do you, how do you wear form, how do you make African wear corporate, or how do you make it formal, or whatever? So um, we still, we've still got a long way to go. I mean, it's great that we have African Day and we have Heritage Day to celebrate our heritage, it's but we're enough. in Africa. It's not enough. You know, we need to be wearing our clothing and our um, patterns and stuff every day of our lives. So it's, it's interesting when we start speaking of textiles mm. um, and patterns and South African identity within fabric, because it is something that we are new in um, as as we were saying earlier on, and, and that we're bringing back from, from China, but also, you know, the evolution of our culture. How do you see your brand then, men and women, evolving in terms of fabric, but also in terms of the, the, the textile designs um, and where you get your influences from? Different South African designers, you'll find they get inspiration from the North, Morocco, from the East. Where, where does your heart lie with Lucilla and how you want us to, to be represented, as you were saying, in the boardrooms, in meetings, in workshops, and in seminars like these? So with Lucilla, our idea is to um, stop like separating each other as South Africans. So we're not focusing on one culture or heritage, we're focusing on all of them. Like I'm Kosa, but this is Ndebele, and it works beautifully. Um, and we, you know, my partner is Sutu, mm -hmm. so that's hence the, the meaning, you know, behind the name. But, so we want everyday wear for different, for all 11 cultures. So we try to get inspiration from the Kosas, the Zulus, the Ndebeles, the Sutus, Songenje. Mm. to just try fit it all in. Hashtag Sanke. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Moving from hashtag Sanke to Soweto. The vibrancy, the youth, the boldness. Because I think also what, what we don't speak of is fashion does have an age sometimes because it has to go with a certain attitude, a certain belief system when you represent yourself. You dress phenomenal people. <laughs> And your, your garments are truly Thank inspirational. You. Thank you so much. Where is that inspiration from? Who? The inspiration comes from, you know, as you said, growing up in Soweto. You know, um, for a boy child especially, you know, growing up buying those fashion magazines and your friends will be going and playing soccer, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like sneaking them in somehow, starting to sketch. Um, I told myself that one day, you know, I want to create magic, you know, and most of my garments actually do represent Africa in my own way, you understand? So I wanted to, to really bring out that inspiration of never giving up, always pushing, and no matter where you come from, you can really make it out there, because my work has been seen in New York, um, Italy as well, so I'm really pushing for, for that young person who is really, you know, wanting to become something bigger than what they are or what they think they are. Are there, is there enough freedom? I guess I'll ask. Mm -hmm. Is there enough freedom for that young spirit? I mean, I look at the veterans who, when I was coming up, people I admired, and I still do. Mm. And they still evolve with, with the times and also with the trends, but also with our needs, um, as you were saying. Is there enough freedom for you to, to establish yourself and, as Zosie would say, occupy your space within mm. this industry? Because mm. it, is, it is limited, and it is, it is, it's not as big as we hoped or, or we wish it could be. Yeah. Well, I think it is. If you know anything is possible, if you're willing to push yourself as much as you can, but also just trying to find the right people to channel you in the right direction. Because I was fortunate enough from showcasing first time at Fashion Week, I started getting magazine editors, you know, and the celebrities also would come. So that really helped me to really put my label or my brand out there. But if you really want to make it somewhere, you just need to channel yourself in the right direction. Thank you. <laughs> Hang on, are you celebrating 20 years? Almost. 
almost 20, 20 years. years. 2002 is phenomenal. I know. Can we give her a round of applause, it's, it's please? It's been like... <laughs> How has it been? Let me not even interrupt you. I'm, we're all patting you on the back. Oh, it's been a journey. It's really been a journey. And um, when you start, I told myself probably a few years ago that, you know, you need to run this entity as a business, you know, because if you don't run it like that, you, you're only pushing your passion. It doesn't bring bread on the table. Yes, you push your passion but it must be sellable. The market must be able to relate to uh, what I've created or my team has created. And also just, you know, valuing your, your, your clients as well. Relationships marketing is very, very integral in this industry. And um, longevity, authenticity, and, um, you know, having a signature as well because I've really kept, I think I've really kept, if you look at the Rubicon out there, you'll know that that's a Rubicon garment. And um, of course, I go back to my heritage and both maternal, from both maternal and, uh, and paternal, and I'll embrace, because both my parents dressed to the nines, and my mother as well brought me up in the same ind industry, I started, working, you know, stitching from a very young age. I was exposed to, the, to needles, machines, Vogue magazines. You know, I was, I was exposed to the beautiful side of, um, of, of um, how to dress and how to make a woman feel beautiful. And that's where I come in with women. I love to make women feel special, you know, because we go through a lot yeah. as human beings. And I call myself a fashion therapist. <laughs> you know, it's That's beautiful. Um, you know, I'm a fashion therapist. It's where you find healing. You know, you wear a Rubicon garment. I really, you 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 get transformed to become something else that maybe you were not before you put on the garment. It is. It truly is beautiful because I, I think that's the one thing we do forget about fashion mm -hmm. and jewelry. You are an integral part of our retail therapy. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> and it really, really does make a difference. Yes. But we do know that finances have everything to do with the things that we consume and possibly the things that we wear. Yes. Gav, as, a, as, 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 as one of South Africa's most prolific atelier designers, we find you in a beautiful collaboration this past summer with Pick and Pay. And we hear about the collaboration, and it's not your first. Um, we know this because you've always wanted to also be accessible to most South Africans. How did the Pick and Pay collaboration come about? And, and are we going to see more of them from you? And as a designer who is high-end, how do you manage to, to separate the two to keep both ends of your consumers satisfied and, and keep us coming back for more? Um, so very interestingly, I mean, um, those of you who know me know me as quite a, I'm very outspoken about many things and sometimes it's held me in good favor and sometimes not. But when I started, and, and I truly feel like a veteran, I, t I tell you, if Langwani feels uh, 20, I feel like I've aged 100 be years. Be kind, be kind to yourself. Uh, <laughs> three hairs on my head tell a long story, you know. Uh, and also, I think it's a people very, we very quickly forget the context in which we kind of started this business. I mean, I started this business literally at the end of apartheid. Uh, and where I was writing letters to editors begging them to feature clothing. I was uh, writing letters in 2003, four, still saying, please, you need to kind of be a bit more kind of representative. But one of the things I realized is that we might have a network, but we don't have a community. And the community is in terms of, you know, I could phone up X, Y, Z and say, hey, you know, can you give me some advice? So my thing has always been, when I started my studio was that young people would have access to it. Um, and so back in 2007, when I was taking young black emerging talent to Paris, it wasn't because I just thought they could do big shows. It was, I wanted them to see a bigger vision 
and to dream bigger and to understand that we don't have to be confined uh, by our location and uh, we can do bigger things. And, and thankfully these are, are brands which are now household. But looking at the pick and pay thing, it stems from that. It stems from, I started way before, just before the lockdown, actually I was in discussion and it's a project called Futurewear. And it's looking for young talent that is not necessarily trained in fashion, but demonstrates some kind of extraordinary prowess in terms of creation. So they could be a jewelry designer, they can be, and we've had artists to the collaborations. And it's an immersive collaboration because I think one of the things is our young creatives come out of um, a college, a school, um, and I hear horror stories about them lugging sewing machines to their school each day and being charged a fortune. And they come out and they don't really have um, any experience in terms of what it is to manufacture something practically. Um, they're not even taught how to sew a button. And so I wanted to create an immersive experience of showing them the commercial side of fashion. Um, you know, we all dream of those 15 seconds of fame on the catwalk, but it's very short lived and behind of it, it really has to be about the business um, and, the, and the kind of finding that fine sensibility between creativity and a commercial sensibility. So the collaborations were looking at um, emerging creatives or existing, uh, you know, established creatives who could take their talent. And it wasn't, you know, it's one thing, you know, people know me as doing couture and one-off, but I'm not really that relevant. In fact, I wouldn't have had a sustainable business if nobody else bought my clothes. You know, if I was only making clothes for supermodels all the time, I don't think I would have actually had a, a business. And I think that's a very important thing that this teaches, this project with Pick and Pay is about creating a collection of clothing in a lands an economic landscape at the moment where it's very difficult to access brands. Uh, people are being very careful with how they spend things. So it's almost like the democratization of fashion. It's taking fashion and making it accessible to the man on the street. Um, and I think that's a very important thing. I think, you know, we can, we have enough pictures of people on social media flaunting their wealth, sitting in first class, business class, whatever. But it's about being quite, it, it's quite tone deaf to what's really happening in the world. So the, the association is really about firstly, creating a beautiful product. It's all manufactured locally. So it's part of that circular economy that you were talking about earlier on. And it's about ensuring that we have a future or we shape the destiny of the clothing manufacturing facilities that we have. I mean, for those of us know in fashion, just how difficult it is to manufacture something at a, at a mass scale. Um, you know, we used to have the most amazing, incredible mills producing fabrics. We don't have that. So maybe with these kind of projects that we're now fostering, we firstly developing new talent, shaping new talent, immersing them in a very hands-on practical environment. And at the same time, helping and building the economy and trying to, you know, in, in recovering during this very kind of fragile um, time. It is indeed a very fragile time. And I, I love the fact that you speak of accommodating the South African consumer in terms of their budget um, and allowing all of us to dream, to, to feel special and to be special in uniquely designed South African garments. And Sandy, you focus on almost looking at it from the opposite side as well as, as this is something that Gavin does as well. Um, but yours is in mentorship and it's in the, 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 the students that you mentor and the, the studio that you house to making sure that those lessons in, in sewing and being a bespoke creator can continue. Please, can you share with our audience exactly what you do at, uh, in Lawrenceville at Victoria Yards? Um, so it was, it's been a long, really interesting journey that's got me to this point here. So how I started at Victoria Yards was I was at Edgar's for 20 years, sure. and I left in about 2017, and I was working with um, the transformation team there. What were you doing at Edgar's? At I used to run the design and um, the design and trend team. Stunning, okay. So I started there, and I built it up to quite a big department, and then, I, then there was this thing that told me that I've got to, I've been meaning to do this thing for a long time. I had this vision of working with designers in 
in a co-op, a coop. And um, so when I left, I had started already working with the transformation team at EDCON, El Alwani, um, who has been, who's actually I'm still working with now. And we had gone through this process with SA Fashion Week of taking designers um, a competition, taking them through the 21 steps to retail and then the design innovation at EDCON where the designers would go build a brand, we'd put the, put the designs on a catwalk and take them through a year internship within EDCON. And when I left, I was like, well, what happens now? They have, we've taken them through this whole process, so how amazing would it be if we could continue? And that's what happened when I left. I started working with these designers and helping them through all the initiatives that came through, through the program took some designers to Milan. We, the designers wanted to show at Fashion Week or we had some orders and I was helping them with the manufacturing of the garments. And I was working with a factory in City Deep and there was a lot of traveling. So I was like, okay, why don't we all just go to one place we at Victoria start. Yards? <laughs> yes. So we start, uh, set up the studio, a design studio, which was a coop studio. And then the factory was the manufacturing side. So it's called the factory and it's the factory is the manufacturing side. So that's basically how it started. And we had all these great, great um, designers, um, a lot of amazing uh, watermelon social club, had um, Neo, um, Ezeketu. So we built some of these designers. They actually had like, you know, they were really talented designers and they were going somewhere. And then obviously lockdown, that all changed. Edcon went into business rescue. So the studio was still standing. The factory was there. So then we just pivoted and we started manufacturing um, whatever we could get orders for. And I was really fortunate in that um, we were given the store space in Mall of Africa. And, you have um, a pop-up store We've right got now. a shop How there. How is that going? So that's, that, so that's what I was like, had all these designers and they needed a place to sell their yeah. clothes. So we now have the shop in um, Mall of Africa. And um, it's grown into quite a, it's a small little um, store and it's just given a nice, it's an amazing outlet for the designers that they're able to still make and build on their brands. So we stock now Ezeketu, Neo, um, Cynthia Foss. We've got a whole little group of designers and we all help each other. Um, I even, because at one stage there wasn't much product in the store, so we were trying to help the designers fill the fill the store. So I st started my own brand as well, just so that we could fill the, Don't fill be the store. about it. It's enormous. Please, and can we give us a so round of and applause? And that's what's nice. Is we've, we've that's got, enormous, Sandy. And now we're paying rent, because in the beginning <laughs> they were giving it to us for free. But now we've all clapped, we all spoke together and, they're all, and everyone wants to carry on. So we, we just help and we all put together and we, we pay the rent. We are at Mall of Africa and these designers yeah. have a lovely little outlet and we help wherever I help wherever I can with mm. the you know with the manufacturing. But these all these designers have employ people to make their clothes. So there's it's part of that whole um, It's the value economy chain, and yeah. the gift that keeps on giving. Yeah. And then our factory has really grown so we're making for other people as well. So that's just a, that's the factory that's joined to Coop Studio. I love the yeah. way that all of you are so humble in how you've all had to evolve your businesses, not just to survive, but to thrive. So we're talking diamonds, we're talking jewelry, but we're talking hey, wholesale, right? Wholesale supplier to manufacturer. Yeah. That's not even just an evolution, that's, that's a change of a business identity. How do you do that? <laughs> I've, I've been fortunate, I've been fortunate. So last year we opened a, a factory in partnership with uh, a company called Pluchenic. Congratulations. Thank you kindly. That was enormous. It's, thank you so, so much. We employ 30 people now that cut and polish our diamonds. And, and the beauty about that and, and listening to everybody's experience, you know, the, the beauty about buying local is you, you impact the lives of so many people with that one purchase. That one diamond in our case is touched by many people. It has to be planned, it has to be blocked, it has to be brilliant. There's an entire process. And, and, and seeing people get the opportunity to earn a living after the difficult times of COVID. You know, some of, some of them have said to me, you don't know what you've done. And, 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 and knowing that we have that type of impact, 
you want to extend it beyond 30 people and go 100 where you can. And this is exactly where we're going. So it's, 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 it's beautiful to hear what, in, in, in your case, just as an example, you know, what you're doing for people. It's amazing. It's amazing. It, it, it really is, and, and what all of you represent is that you're, you're part of us and every part yeah. of our lives, yeah. and, and when we're feeling a little bit like this, then you, you're there for us, and when we're feeling a little bit like this, <laughs> you're there for us. Yeah. You, you speak of the corporate side, but you're also enormous in our celebration side, mm. and this is what we do, I think, as a, as a South African yeah. people, <laughs> is we like to celebrate. Yes. So weddings, girl. <laughs> Yes. Which is a lu an enormously lucrative business because we marry every Easter, every mm. winter when it's KZN inside, and then we bring it back to the rest of South Africa when it's September and December. Those are two different identities. As I was saying, you all speak so humbly about evolving through the demands that we have as your consumers. That must be a totally different mind shift. But does it mean, is it different seamstresses? Please take us through the, your, your production line. What does that mean? Because you're, you're, you're manufacturing two different products, so to speak, for two different, not target markets, but, but parts of our lives, I guess. Um, so we work with um, a CMT, which is a, a factory of seamstresses in Cape Town. And um, it's 90% women. So um, with all our garments, they do everything. So they do the, um, so we come with the design, we sit with them and then they draw the pattern and then they do the sizing. And like Sandy mentioned, sometimes the pattern doesn't work so you have to do it a few times. And then they sew the products and we get, you know, to have the finished item. So um, even with our production line or the, the whole line, it's, we try to ensure that we're not against men, <laughs> but we, <laughs> we're not. Let me just put that out there. We're not. <laughs> but we try to employ like 80% women because obviously like single mama, we're mothers, we're like sisters, whatever. But, um, and, you know, it, it, it's great now that we're a South Africa where we have women who are breadwinners. You know, you're not relying on a man to go out and work. These women are are working, bringing in the money for the children and, and things like that. It's absolutely beautiful, it is, right? So look, we, we speak our brand identity, proudly South Africa, we're, we're here today because, you know, we're politely asking the question, Zan, so you're wearing local, but I mean, you know, it's, it's one of those things, like, let's get to it. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yes. Brand identity is very important. Your logo is very powerful and very strong. To young designers, I mean, I, I, as, as Hangwani was saying, I, I see a little thing and I know that's Rubicon. Mm -hmm. I see a little thing, I know it's Nungu. I see a little thing, I know it's Gavin. Yeah. I know <laughs> it's Carlo. <laughs> yeah. To young designers who, who are wanting to occupy that space, please take us through, because it's who you are and it's, it's who you want us to see you as mm -hmm. outside of what we wear. Yeah. Can you take us through that process? Because as Sandy was saying, just making the label is an, is an industry in itself. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually so important. That's mm. important. It is. It definitely Please say is. that again, Sandy. We missed that. It's so important. That mm. part, it's like, it yeah. can, it's, it's, it's amazing how important it is. Yeah. yeah. But, well, the basics are, well, with me, it starts with, with an idea. You know, I have to be inspired by anything. You know, sitting here, I could be inspired by anything at all. And then it goes to, obviously, sourcing the fabrics, doing the pattern, doing samples. Um, but I'm more involved in handwork, like beadwork, a lot. So I, I do a lot of that off late. And I think that is the direction that I want to take. But coming back to the logo. Is, is it a da before we get back to the <laughs> logo, because this is interesting to me, and, and all of you, please if, feel free to answer this question. Is it a case of following our needs of you as our designers and creatives that make us feel special? Or how much is it you leading us in terms of, well, not you going to like this. Sandy's saying, you, you probably like that. How much of it, yes, please, anybody feel free um, to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, so I think it's a bit of both. 
like um, the dress that I'm wearing, I'm gonna call, I'm gonna shout out SA. Stunning, by the way. Thank you so much. When you much. walked in, I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> Thank you so much. When we designed it, I said um, our air hostesses for South African Airways don't wear proudly South African, right? Mm. So when I designed it, that was the idea behind it. You've given it. me goosebumps because I'm oh. imagining our, our stewardesses right? walking through the... So South African Airways, you have been called Hala. out <laughs> <laughs> by Lucilla. Um, so, um, but you know, my partner, and you're not allowed to take a picture with him because he's got a crush on you, but okay. you know... <laughs> <laughs> We've been warned, wherever you are, partner. <laughs> <laughs> Only if I can order this dress from you. Is that a deal? A deal. If I can order this dress from you, then I won't take a picture, okay? But uh, <laughs> my partner always, um, like, like, shows me your Instagram. Because I'm not on social media, but he always shows me. He's like, this is what, you know, South African celebrities should be about. Because you actually don't just say, we're local, and then say, mama, I've made it with Gucci. You come out with my costa, you come out with, you know, so everything that you're about is what we're after. So we would design items where we're like, Unati would wear this. Mm. She would look stunning in it. And then Sagtega, City Unati, come on, man. No, I'm here now. I'm going to follow you now. I'm going to follow you on Instagram now. Awesome. I Thank love you. that. So it's, it's a symbiotic relationship Absolutely. with your clients. Co creation. Co creation. Absolutely. I love that. Mm. Talking about creation, back to logo. Yes. <laughs> back to your logo, so, sorry. My name is Silo, right? Yes. So you know what does Silo mean? Kasho. Okay, Silo means to, to cry. To cry, okay. But tears of joy. Because yes. I asked my mother, why did you? And it's taken from my grandfather. So it was tears of joy. Um, so I just decided to, the A part of my logo, it's literally a teardrop. So I worked with my graphic designer to make it very modern and you know, striking in a way. So, yeah, and people, with the label as well, people just started calling me Scalo. Because, you know, growing up in Soweto, people would literally just give you nicknames. <laughs> yeah. And I just love the name. And every, everywhere I went now, they would call me Scalo, Scalo. So I just decided to take that and just create that nice teardrop at my, for my logo. That's it's absolutely beautiful, right? And emotional and meaningful. Yeah. And that's what you were saying, Sam. It's actually a very important part for you. Because we, we, we just, do you know what I mean? We fall in love with the label. You know, I see it and I'm like, oh, I'm wearing Raja today. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's more emotional for yeah. you, which is, which is something I think I've always overlooked as, as a lover of fashion. Our logo How long does is it take a, you? Our logo is a K for coupe, but when you turn it, it's a person to show the collaboration and how and we work together. Yeah. It's, it, it's incredible, right? Yeah. So that was important and it's like, it's, you, really, you really treasure that and you, and you, and you look after it. Yeah. How does that make you feel, Hang on, I'm coming to you in, in international trends. How does it make you feel seeing that on another human being then? <laughs> Like, Goosebumps. <laughs> Goosebumps. I can imagine, right? It's amazing. It's, a, it's amazing. Because I go through it at home, right? And, then yeah. I, and I go through your logo and I'm like, no, damn it. And then I turn it around and then it's the certification. And I'm like, but for you, that yeah. it, must be, it, it must be immense. So it's, it's total affirmation, right? Mm. Yeah. To know that somebody's wearing something you've created for them and they're wearing it with pride and you're a part of their lives like that. Like how, you, like how you're saying, in, in your case, you see yourself as a, as a therapist of sorts, yeah. right? You, it's, it's a feel-good thing. Well, I, I say this all the time, we're in the business of happiness, right? So you want to leave your client feeling like, man, this I'm thing really is amazing. I'll hook you up. <laughs> <laughs> and he means it. And he means it. This question to Hangwani and Gav, as, as women all over the world are obsessed with your designs. You have women from Nigeria to the United Kingdom to New York, Swaziland, Paris, Milan, Gav. You've got Boston, people in Boston wearing your things. And I guess, do you... Because there's a thin line, right, between wanting people to know who we are as Africans creatively, but also meeting the international, not standards, because the standards are there, and I will never disrespect you in any way by saying the standards, but possibly trends or preferences. Let me not go with trends, because I don't think any of you no. succumb to trends. Mm -hmm. Preferences. Um, I, I agree with you on that. You know, I've never followed trends. 
and um, I feel like as a, as a creator, I call artists creators. You know, we, we're trying to solve what we've envisioned and our inspirations. Um, like I said, I draw more from heritage because that's who I am and I would like to sell the authentic self of who I am. And also, obviously, the clothes need to be functional, need to be sellable, like how Gavin had, um, you know, had said earlier on regarding um, that, the, yes, the couture is amazing. Like I was, I was, I was having a chat yeah. with Silo earlier on that, you know, you're doing amazing. And, uh, and in this day of age from COVID, it's very difficult to be where he is at now because people are more into wanting to feel comfort, um, you know, comfortable yeah. and beautiful at the same time. So meeting what the, you know, the, the entire value chain now currently needs, it's very important that you, we sell, we make what the market needs. And um, getting back into the international scene, you have to, when I say heritage, I'll go back to perhaps maybe my baby album, how I grew up, you know, and um, back in the days, you know, my dad was an activist. He, he, was, um, he was a freedom fighter, but he dressed to the nines. He, they made themselves look so beautiful. I think that's how they cover their pain. And um, such a profound yeah, thing to say because is. it is part of our history and you yeah. do see it from decade to decade. Yes. So hence, I always say, I always go back to the era of fashion, like the history of fashion back into the 1920s, how the silhouettes were like and try and still bring them in a modernized way now or the 50s era, come bring it back in a modernized but and also functional where a person can wear it on a more daily, more day to day basis. Yeah. I love how I've known. I, I just want to. Oh. Oh. Sorry, no, I was just, I loved listening to you because I've known um, your brand Rubicon over so many years yes. now and truly um, we put her heart and, and that yeah. when you speak about it now I can actually see yeah. everything that you talk about in your in your collections yeah, and your designs. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's the, the voice behind the genius I think yeah. that's the other title of yeah. today's yeah. panel. Yeah. Gav as you were you were about to contribute as well? Uh, so I want to say this and I, I'm gonna, I, you know before I say this because it might come across wrongly but I want to say it with all respect and I mean um, you, you are right, we, you know, it's one thing to sell in South Africa, but our true success relies in volume and a bigger market internationally. And I think we, to a large extent, are very much, must have to also be very careful into what we play in versus to, to a stereotype of what people perceive us as oh, South African. Oh, Gavin, it's so important because the stereotype is so poverty stricken. Mm -hmm. Cheap. Yeah, so we have to move away from this poverty porn narrative yes. and playing in that kind of sphere because I don't want to be in this barter flea market space when I'm in Boston, New York, Milan, just because I'm in South Africa doesn't mean my clothes are any lesser than, in fact, some of my stuff is even better made than Chanel, I have to say. Because I've done Thank you. Thank you. Round of applause but, for that. <laughs> same thing we got to be careful in terms of looking at where we are because otherwise we get to New York or you get to London and keep, people keep on saying, oh, the print, where's this, where's that? Yeah, sure, it's been immersed into our culture, but don't forget the history of how it came into our culture is actually Indonesian, it's Sumatran, it's Batik. And I think we have to look at where we're going to go in the future, and the future lies in collaborations. I mean, it relies with working with artists to reinvent prints. If you know, if we talk and work with Kusama to reinvent, reinvent things with Sparse, I think we will need to take it to the next level without being absolutely just playing, playing into that stereotype. Because somehow the West expects us to be always driven by things which are maybe sometimes for one season on trend. But at the end of the day, for us to be global players, we still have to play within the thing of trend. Um, we can interpret it the way we want to do. We can be irreverent with color because we're African, we play into our culture, whatever it is. But I do think we've got to look past this because I think 
we end up jailing ourselves. It's the same problem why India has this amazing manufacturing industry. Yeah. But are there any major international Indian designers out there? Because while the sari might be fashionable, it's not fashion. And I think there's a fine line between traditional costume, dress, and high fashion. And so the, the reality of the situation is that we, if we want to be these global kind of players, I mean, I look at uh, people that I really admire, and I, I mean, I just uh, worked with Laduma quite two weeks ago. I mean, I love the fact that how he's taking something which is a traditional cultural reference, mm. but putting a contemporary slant on it, yeah. as opposed to using it just in its purest natural form okay. and i think that's also where we have to start thinking about it it moves just past us having to take a print which is a traditional print and using it because we from africa we south african where it's part of like a traditional culture mm -hmm. because that's also an appropriation of something which then starts playing into a very different kind of space so wow. um yeah that's just my thing really on it it would interest me to find out in terms of, you know, the, the whole process of our yeah. resources, yeah. what the collaborative process is for you. Because, you know, as, as Gavin and Hangwani have, have not even alluded to, stated to, there are global standards. Mm. But in, in, in beneficiation, your industry is very snooty. <laughs> <laughs> your industry is extremely... Yeah non-inclusive <laughs> i'm trying to be polite here hey, man. You're, you're i'm trying right. to be polite you're so right. so how do you how do you how do you infiltrate it how do you do what yeah. what gavin and hangwani are saying in terms of setting the standards and not being the cheesy then loud diamonds mm. and gold that people expect you to be and yeah. and you actually come with a very reformed elegant and very dainty representation of this big thing that yeah. is spoken about from London Bridge to uh, Beyonce and Jay-Z. <laughs> I think, I think, I think how do you maintain your dignity and grace? Because I know that's very important for you uh, and your wife, yeah. Rishla. I think interestingly, in, in our case, it's almost like the world was waiting for some black guy to come from the continent and start selling diamonds. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? It's a good thing. Okay. It's a good thing. It's a very okay. good okay. thing. Be because, you know, the question becomes, when do you start owning your narrative, right? Yes. And, and, and what better way to own that diamond narrative than to have the black guy do it? But I don't play the black guy all the time, right? I know this. You, 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 you park that, it's yes, I'm black, of course I am. But yeah. excellence first, right? And, 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 and not, not to, 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 to do a play on the black excellence talk, but more about be, be, be the businessman you say you are. In, in the diamond trade, it's very important to be to be true to your word, yeah. that's what people respect. And I, and I don't think it's a diamond business thing only, it's a business thing in general. Yeah. Follow through all the time and, and represent your position as best as you can. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm far from apologetic about what we do. Yeah. I say this all the time, we, we sell diamonds to people that resonate with our message. Whether you're black or white, we're happy to sell to you yeah. for as long as you resonate with our message. Yeah. And, and we, we don't limit ourselves much to what, what Gavin is saying. We don't, we don't limit ourselves to only the narrative of the continent. We're, we're here to say we're players in the trade, yeah. and this is what we yeah. represent. And if you align, you align. And if you don't, we're not going to be everybody's cup of tea, of course. You know, you're not going to be. Can I just say that yeah. I've been watching you for ages on social media, and I just think you, uh, as, a, as a jewelry brand, it's amazing. And I mean, I cut my teeth actually doing stuff for De Beers and, and Agla Dolashanti, but. I just love the fact that you've taken it and you've elevated and you've, you, you, ah. you could put it anywhere in the world and it could hold its own. Yeah. I'm so humbled well by that. I'm, I'm humbled in. by that. Thank you. That's your kind of vision. And I can see the excellence and I can see the amazing kind of level of craftsmanship behind it. So, I mean, wow. well done to you on that. Thank you. Th thank you so, so much. I mean, just... Just in Dubai in the past few days. He literally landed three hours ago, hey, Gav. Man. Literally. <laughs> so I WhatsApped him this morning because because I was going through the list because I was thinking, okay, who am I going to wear? So I was going through everybody and I was like, okay, too much couture. <laughs> we haven't met. We haven't met. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And then so I, I 
so I, I, I messaged him this morning. I said, oh, I can't wait to catch up with you. Haven't seen Osha in a while. He's like, um, I'm still flying back from Dubai. <laughs> I'm like, when are you going to land? Are you going to be okay? That's what I said. He's like, yeah, I'll make it. It's that excellence thing. I, 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 I worked out my plan such that I prioritize this. I well, one of the things that were fantastic was seeing how even in Dubai, the, the, the sense is South African diamonds are amazing. Yeah. Right? Yes. And, and, and people... Without a doubt. People feel more and more comfortable to say it these days, yeah. I feel. When I'm traveling and I'm, I'm told, man, your, your diamonds are amazing. Your diamond story is amazing as Ooh. one of the sources of diamonds in the continent. Yeah. And, and, and to see people now beginning to respond that way and embrace what we do is amazing. It really is. And, and you know, on, on, to, on to more, on to bigger. Yeah. But, but what is most important is impact, right? I'm not doing this for myself. I had, a, I had a son, uh, my son was born on the 18th of Feb. So it's, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Just the other day. Just the other day. It's a legacy Literally, thing. Yeah. <laughs> it's a legacy thing now. So, so pe people must remember the, the porcupine for its impact. So Nungu, is, it means porcupine in Swahili. It's, it's, it's a small but resilient animal. It's That's beautiful, we right? We, we have less than seven minutes left, and I, I apologize for taking up so much of your time. I was meant to open up the floor uh, <laughs> and allow you to ask any questions. So please let me know if you do have any questions, and we'll just make sure that you are heard. Uh, we're also giving away, uh, I, I'm sure you've heard of the drip sneakers. So we're gonna be running a competition and giving away a pair of sneakers um, because this panel is just so gracious and giving. When it comes to the world and how, and I want to say this in, in, a, in the nicest possible way, when the world borrows from you, yeah. because you are the definers of aesthetics and how the world sees us, mm. what are you happy with? What are you not happy with? And how would you like the world to remember your product by and how we experience it. I don't know. I'm, I'm going to ask yeah. every one of you as, as our <coughs> parting comments. I'm, I'm okay with the world borrowing from us. I think we're... Are you okay? I think we're amazing. I think they should. I think may, maybe they have been in some ways and, and they, haven't want, they haven't wanted to tell us. that. That's, to give us the credit. There you go. There Instagram. You go. There you go. <laughs> yes. It's the simplest and dumbest as well. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but the truth is, no, no one does it the way we do it. And I think, I think in, 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 again, in the proudly South, Africa, South African narrative, we, we have to begin thinking like that. Yeah. To say, uh, our value goes way beyond what you can imagine. Begin thinking of ourselves like how the, the Arabs do, as, as what I saw, and how they wear their gubs and they, you know, they, they wear it proudly at, at the airports, at the malls, wherever they go. So we, we need to begin thinking the same of ourselves. 100%. Sandy? Um. <laughs> <laughs> I think, um, I just think we just make beautiful things. Mm. Everyone <laughs> will like them and be remembered for, and be proud of whatever it is you're making, because you want to wear it yourself or you want someone else to wear it. So just make beautiful things and keep getting better and keep striving to be the best you can. And that's basically, and like you say, part of it is creating jobs. I do think that that is like a really big part of it is how you can, how you can really build this, um, this industry back up again. Sure. That is something that I think I'd like to be remembered for. That's beautiful. Tanya? Um, oh, did sorry, you want to Gavin? interject, Gav, before we move on? Uh, no, I just wanted to kind of reiterate what uh, Kiala Bocha was saying. And it's really about, you know, establishing a tradition of great workmanship and skill. I mean, if you look at any international house, the biggest thing is they're like Maison Fondi, which is house established in and like 18, whatever. But it's made in a tradition of craftsmanship, which actually at the end of the day, like everything you do, you know, you're only as good as the last collection of dress you made. Sure. After that, once it's done, you move on to the next thing and you try to improve. But if you can keep that level and that standard and that um, base on which you base your work on and you're, you're, you are driven to kind of constantly innovate, then I think 
you've got a good brand and your brand is then built on kind of the, you know, the, the success of kind of continuous kind of refinement. Thank you, Gav. Tanya? My answer might be a little bit controversial, but I think um, I'm okay with the world borrowing, but they shouldn't steal it, right? Because sometimes we say borrow and what they've actually done is stolen it from us. And it's okay for them to be inspired by us. Yes, they can they, be inspired. They cannot replicate but who they we cannot, are. Yes, and and when they are inspired by us, like they do in music, if I use a beat you've created, I need to state that it's yours. Yeah. It needs to be the same in fashion. Where if I've taken a design that is Sandy's, I need to say that it's hers. Yeah. So give credit where it's due, and um, ensure that like because <clears throat> as South Africans, though, what we do need to do is understand that just because it's sold in America doesn't make it better quality than what mm. we have in South Africa. It's a non-negotiable. Mm. I mean, that's, it does, that doesn't even need to come up anymore. Mm. Do you understand? <laughs> just, <laughs> can we please? Can we please just, just stop talking about that? <laughs> so yeah. with, with me, I guess I agree with Gavin, you know. It's inspiration. They need to inspired. Let's put it like that, get inspired, mm. not stealing. And, you know, which means we are literally doing great work if they are actually, you know, being inspired by us, yes. you know, and um, it's, it's actually a good thing, you know, and it's empowering the next generation to know that whatever they are also going to create, you know, can inspire the world. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because I've, I've seen pictures of, you know, the, they call it the, the Konzekai. Yeah. The and the yeah, the bag. <laughs> the, 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 yeah, I don't know if I should. They know oh, that bag, about. yes, that bag. <laughs> the big bag. The big bag. Oh, <laughs> so, yes, the chicken one. <laughs> Red and blue. So I saw this yeah. big, big, big brand. <laughs> The international ba uh, brand, yeah. I'll just, we can yeah, call them out. starts they with an L. It. So they created a more expensive version of, of that bag. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess also, I just want to plead out to South Africans out there. Mm -hmm. They should start really taking us seriously because we invest a lot in making these garments. I take it for me. I, I invest a lot in my garments. So, you know, a client would come and they would say, oh, I want you to design for me. You sit down with them, consult, everything is done, whatever. And you give them the price. Problem. Yeah. Huge. Why are you Huge. charging me that much? Huge. And that, at that time, the person is wearing Gucci from head to toe. In your studio. So. Carrying a what bag? Like. In a what car? Head to toe. <laughs> In a what shoe? However, when they look at your work and they look at, you know, Gucci, as Gavin has said, you know, it's, it's like the same... The same oh, thing. Yeah. Yours can even be more. And it often is crowd. because there's more time. However, because you're still starting out, you're just in South Africa, they just feel like, okay, um, you know, why should but I be paying there. so much? Why should I be doing that? Yes. Mm. And I think that's a big problem and South Africans need, really need to change their mindsets. I think to educate a lot of South Africans in, in, in how they do look down on, on local atelier and bespoke and our couture is all these, these names that you call are family names. Mm. Mm. So why can't we build our family names? Why exactly. can't we build, you know, the Rajas? Why mm. can't we? Mm. You know what I mean? Why can't I walk into the house of Raja instead of, you know, seeing the lion? That doesn't make sense. That goes around the corner Yo. for Gucci and Cartier. Mm. These are family names. So can we, as legacy, can we start building family names here in South Africa? Yeah. Absolutely. Ms. Rubicon, to close today's panel. <laughs> you know, um, I've been copied before as well. You know, by it's now. heartbreaking, right? Yeah, it's very heartbreaking. But I had moved away from that logo because um, I needed to rebrand Rubicon. So the old one was copied by the likes of LV. Can't even say they, they had the bubbles thing, which I had exactly the way it was. So it shows, you know, when you're like, um, you know, our Fashion Week platforms, they give you exposure to, to, to the international space, you know, platform. So that's where they get to see. I mean, the likes of Makosa now, Hert as well, they're copying. They're just copying, and they're, the price that is out there, it's just ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And you think of all the work that has gone. I mean, 
Silo, he's, he's employed. I've employed people. There are families that are dependent on, on us. So we are creating, developing the economy. We are part of the GDP of South Africa. So when these international people come and do cultural appropriation with our brands, it just, it just not, yeah, it's very sad. And also, um, it also, like what Silo was saying, the, our, our, okay, South Africans, we need to support local. Yeah. We need to start here because these are your families. You don't want to think of black tax. <laughs> they must be able to support themselves as well, you know. So we are also creating employment. And I think really the creative industry has been looked down upon for the longest time in South Africa. And it's time that even our government takes us really seriously. Even the people in the public sector, they need to really appreciate what we're doing.